And we are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Translators on Air. My name is Dmitry Kornyukhov. I'm your host. Uh, joining me today, my incredible co-host, Elena Tereshenkova. Hi, Elena. Hello. And our guest today, uh, Alexey Kozuleyev. Hello, Alexey. Hi. Uh, Alexey uh, is the head of the Moscow School of Audiovisual Translation and the CEO of Rufilms. Uh, he's teaching audiovisual translation, uh, and his school has developed a unique uh, university level uh, audiovisual translation programs and contributed to the emergence of uh, Rufilms as the leading company uh, in the Russian subtitle translation market, featuring such customers as Blizzard, uh, Aeroflot, Aerogroup. Fox CIS and many others. Alexey also holds a PhD degree in language education. And the topic of our conversation today is going to be audiovisual translation and the challenges of audiovisual translation. But before we go to uh, discuss about today's topic, uh, I'd like to make a few announcements as always. Uh, the second season of Translators on Air has been sponsored by our friends at, at Smarkat. Smarkat offers translation technology for translators, and they provide it absolutely for free. So if you're looking for a great CAD tool, check out Smarkat by clicking the green button below this video. Or if you're watching this or listening this in the recording, just check out the first link in the description. Uh, all right, we have uh, quite a few people joining us. Uh, hello, Aureli, Harold Hagen, Franca, Una, Kazuki, Fernanda, Jessica, Sihau, Louis, Annette, Monica, I hope uh, I haven't butchered any, any of your names. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, for those of you who are watching this for the very first time, uh, this is a live webinar. So Alexey, Yelena, and I uh, have prepared uh, a couple of great questions and topics for discussion. But if you guys have a, a question that you would like to ask, uh, feel free to click the orange button that says ask a question or suggest a topic, or you can use the chat window on the right-hand side uh, where you can uh, say hi and say where you're from and have a lovely conversation. Okay, uh, right, let's get started. Alexey, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? I'm good. Uh, how was your day? Well, the day was pretty busy uh, because uh, we are gearing up for several customers uh, in the Western Hemisphere. And also, we had a few discussions concerning uh, university classes uh, in several Russian universities. Mm, sounds amazing. That's sounds awesome. interesting, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's get down to our conversation, I think. Um, and the first question is, uh, can audiovisual translation be regarded as an independent type of translation? Uh, you see, uh, it is uh, amusing. Uh, because in Russia, uh, audiovisual translation is still considered to be the black sheep in the family because uh, while in the West and also in the East, uh, audiovisual translation uh, has been studied as a separate field of translation since approximately 1995. So we are in this respect about 20 years behind the rest of the world. Uh, and. Uh, well, it uh, happened due to the fact that uh, at a certain point uh, uh, we restricted ourselves to just a few types of translation, which is synchronous translation, uh, oral translation, and written translation. All the other types were regarded as adaptation, not as mm -hmm. translation. Uh, so, uh, audiovisual translation was relegated to uh, some secondary role and uh, it, is the, it used to be the same thing in, the, uh, in other countries as Jorge Diaz Sintas from the uh, Imperial College in London uh, noticed in his book, uh, Audiovisual Translation, Remarks on the Studies of the Issue. He uh, pointed out that for a long time, in, even in the Western scientific thought, audiovisual translation was regarded as adaptation. In, it took several uh, years uh, to change uh, the point of view, and it happened due to the fact that since 2009, the amount of audiovisual content that needed to be translated increased 50 fold. Hmm. It, it actually well, it includes uh, game, games, uh, broadcast, 
uh, videos, non-broadcast, educational, uh, mobile services, uh, educational courses, university courses, and all this content grows because right, right now there is another fad. A lot of corporations uh, shift their educational video, educational materials to the video format, and it is another uh, source of uh, materials to be translated. And audiovisual productions are very different in regard to how they need to be translated. Could you name some uh, of the most uh, probably obvious differences between audiovisual translation, text for audiovisual translation, and uh, regular documents? Uh, yes. Uh, the first, uh, actually, there were seven basic differences. And mm -hmm. when we establish our courses, we uh, teach people how to cross the abyss from translating texts to translating complex discourses. What are these steps? What are these steps? The first one is that uh, when we translate audiovisual productions, uh, texts uh, are only one source of information for any person who views. You do not read uh, an audiovisual production. You view it. So you can mm -hmm. see, for example, when you watch me, you do not only listen to the flow of my words, you also watch my facial uh, expression, my gestures. Uh, if we speak about other productions, video may be even more eloquent. They can show even more information. And in fact, the University of Leeds conducted several experiments that showed that the visual stream actually is the dominant one. And most translators do not know how to analyze the visual part. And uh, they, this leads us to the second difference. The second difference is that uh, the visual stream uh, puts uh, a lot of constraints on the translator. You have to adapt the verbal stream, the text, to the need of uh, fitting lips, of fitting subs. You have to make it shorter. That's another thing. The third difference is uh, that audiovisual productions are about emotions. When you watch a comedy and when you translate it, you still want it to remain a comedy, right? If you watch yep. an interesting uh, educational course, which is very interesting when performed by a professor from Stanford or Harvard, you want it to remain interesting when you translate it, you don't want it to become dull. You want to have, you yeah. want it to have the same emotional impact. Yeah. Uh, this is the third difference. The fourth difference is that all audiovisual disc discourses are stories. They are hmm. coherent codes. You cannot uh, single out well a story. When you watch, for example, a piece of news, uh, it is a story about something that happened, for example, in some country of the world. When you watch a movie and other episodes of, say, uh, The Game of Thrones, it is a story. When you watch an educational movie, it is a story, not just a sequence of sentences. It cannot be split, because we, if, if, if we split it and the unit of analysis is not a sentence, when you translate a movie, you do not translate sentences. When, for example, the main character says, hi, and uh, the next sentence is, uh, I've been waiting for you for so long, there might be two minutes of screen time between these two sentences, and the mm -hmm. character might have aged by 10 years. So <laughs> it is uh, another world, and you have to yeah. consider all that. So it is a story. Then, audiovisual, the fifth difference is that audiovisual translation is audience oriented. You cannot translate an audiovisual production without first establishing who is going to watch your movie. When you translate a manual, for example, on uh, uh, some hard drive or computer mm -hmm. piece, the only thing you need to know is that people, specialists in computers, are going to read that. But you don't want to know whether they are men or women, whether they are mm. young or old, whether they are university level, uh, whether they have university level education or high school education. But when you translate a movie, 
or an educational course, you always have to know who is your who your audience is because one of the very good examples of that is when you translate a movie for kids in the so-called grown-up language using words which kids do not mm -hmm. recognize, kids start either crying or lose all interest in the movie that you translate it's simple so these are five basic differences there are two more but they are less relevant that's it you see, it's quite enough to consider it uh, a, a separate type of audiovisual translation, very different from other ones. Yeah, obviously. Um, and what are some of the skills that a translator who wants to work in this area needs to acquire? Uh, one of the skills is, uh, well, I forgot to mention the sixth difference, which is very important mm -hmm. and which is uh, the basis of the skill. Uh, when you translate an audiovisual production, you do not just translate, you transcreate. You take a piece uh, uh, which uh, is a uh, whole in, uh, for example, the English production of the Game of Thrones is a coherent piece and you recreate it in uh, Russian, German, French, making it also a whole with the same emotional impact. So the key skill which an audiovisual translator has to possess is uh, the ability to transcreate. Mm -hmm. The ability to transcreate the mastery of his or her own language and culture. Because when you transcreate, you do not only have to understand what the whole thing is uh, about in the source culture and source language. But also, you have to understand how you are going to put it for the specific audience of kids, youngsters, uh, or some other audience in the target language. So you have to have the grasp of the actual language uh, that your country, your culture speaks. So this is mm -hmm. the second skill. And also, you have to have the mastery of... Uh, the processes, how your production, how your translation is going to be integrated into subtitles, into dubbing, etc., etc. So this is the second skill. And uh, the third one is uh, the good grasp of uh, the ability to analyze the story and the visual stream. That's what we teach, because most of the translators do not have that in their uh, education. That's it. Mm -hmm. And, and um, uh, how can uh, translators develop those skills? Because uh, those skills are, seems like are very complex and they, they differ. They are very different from what uh, uh, translators normally do. That is translated sentence by sentence. Actually, when we develop transcreation, we do that by posing, uh, people say, let's proceed, some people say, why don't you proceed from smaller tasks to larger ones? Mm -hmm. But in case of teaching transcreation, it doesn't work. For example, when we do, when we start our classes in transcreation, we usually ask our students to translate jokes. Because jokes are very culture specific. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, there, are, there are very few universal jokes, but uh, an ability to recreate, recreate a joke is actually a test in the ability of a translator to transcreate. Because some people cannot do that, and for them it's a filter. Some people mm -hmm. say, well, I, I really won't be able to cross that threshold. Sorry, uh, the dropout rate in our courses is about 50%. For example, usually we have about 100, 200 people who start a course. And at, at the end of a six-month course, we usually have about 50 people. We give them an opportunity uh, to uh, test themselves because actually it's more of a, of a trip into their own ego. People, most of the translators do not understand what they are re really capable of. So we allow people to diagnose themselves. Mm. Because uh, uh, it is not just the mechanical knowledge of words, of certain programs. People who love that, uh, like working with, uh, as I say, mechanical translation. Well, there is a good niche uh, right now, the machine translation, 
well, it's growing and it requires also a certain psychological type of person. For example, for me, machine translation is boring. I cannot do that because it's boring. It for me, uh, it uh, deprives the profession of, of its very essence. But for some people, it's quite okay. Yep. And uh, it's actually a selection, a uh, well, kind of uh, threshold, which now exists in the entire industry. You have to choose different paths. You cannot be a trans creator and a machine translator at the same time. These are mm -hmm. two different modes of thinking. They are all needed by the society. The modern society won't survive without both. It mm -hmm. doesn't mean that one is superior and another one is inferior. They are just different. It's like the difference between natural sciences and humanitarian sciences. They do not exclude each other. You, they both are needed in the modern society, but you have to understand that now this threshold is very, very evident. And it is, uh, the selection should be made at the very beginning. Uh, another question which you, uh, you may ask, is machine translation uh, applicable to audiovisual translation? After I gave you the key differences, what is your answer? Is machine translation it's applicable? <laughs> <laughs> it's obvious. At least at the current level of the technological development, the machines cannot sense human feelings. The machine cannot mm -hmm. sense pain. The machine can. The machines cannot sense a lot of feel, a lot of human feelings. Maybe in 40, 50 years, they would feel all that. Maybe the human race would become redundant. But it's all science fiction uh, yeah. <laughs> stuff right now. And, uh, at least I am assured that for my students, for their future, at least 30, 40 years of their future professional development are more or less uh, uh, human-based. Human mm -hmm. at least. No, no, but they won't have to uh, kind of uh, retool themselves urgently, learning how to work with the machine variants of translation movies. Maybe in the future it will be possible, but for the time being, I am conservative. Yeah. yeah, so 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 are we because uh, it's 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 really hard to believe that uh, machine translation will have a greater impact impact on audiovisual translation because of all, of all the things you've said, it's uh, it's analyzing the video, it's uh, analyzing the story, mm -hmm. it's uh, analyzing uh, facial expressions, uh, the feelings of, of the, the characters. So uh, machines are not capable of doing that at this time, uh, at least. So, uh, you uh, see, I see a very good uh, point made by Sihan about the Google neural translation. I recently I made a presentation in Geneva. Uh, the topic of the conference was uh, uh, the applications of artificial intelligence to various types of translation. And I researched this issue very uh, deeply. And even the head of the Google uh, neural uh, translation team uh, pointed out that uh, the application of uh, these, these technique to translating audiovisual content at the current level of development is not possible because uh, actually I quoted his words. So they can it cannot be ignored. But uh, the highest guru pointed out that folks, there are barriers that even their technology still cannot tackle. So I'm sorry, uh, Sihan, it's that way, and it's not from me, but from Google. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think it's it's great news for everyone who is involved in audiovisual <laughs> translation, uh, because it probably means that we still have uh, you'll still have plenty of work <laughs> to do as humans. All of us. All of us. I, so, uh, actually, I don't I don't work in audiovisual translation, but I work in marketing translation and dipping my toes in literary translation and. Uh, it's basically also about transcreation, not just translating sentence by sentence. And uh, I don't see how machine translation can, uh, okay, take away my job, take away my work <laughs> at, the, at the current uh, state of the technology. So I see, see the thing is that uh, I monitor uh, the developments pretty closely and mm -hmm. uh, literary translation is different from uh, audiovisual translation. It's just obviously in one, is. 
No, it is different than just in one respect. It deals mm -hmm. with texts. And uh, mm -hmm. very many people make an assumption. If it deals with texts, there should be always a way to apply machine translation. No, I understand that literary translation, uh, copywriting, no, folks. Uh, with copywriting, it won't work. And literary translation is actually producing a copy. You are producing a different uh, work of art. I'm sorry. When yes, you translate, just, in, just in the other language. Of art. If you are producing a copy, you are doing actually copywriting. This is what uh, most people forget. It is not translation either. In our case, we used to be treated as adaptation. You are copywriters, uh, literary translators. So we are again not translation, word for word, at yeah. large. You see, the mm -hmm. thing is that if we narrow the terminology, translation is something like you take a word and translate it word for word. And word, uh, this is the approach which I really don't like. But unfortunately, uh, it is now more or less dominant, but it's not that way. With only visual translation, it merely won't work. Because uh, there are so many comedies which are not funny when translated using this word-for-word, -word, sentence for sentence approach. Because they are just merely not funny. They are not comedies. They, they lose their humor. And these are the money that are wasted. In our case, our approach is supported by content distributors because they invest money not just in movies. They invest money in comedies, horror movies, because some people may frighten you or may frighten the Americans, but if not properly translated, translated they may not seem frightening or scary to us. It is also mm -hmm. the issue of melodramas because some of the people well, for example, we used to have this problem with the Indian films because some of the Indian conflicts, so uh, I mean society conflicts, when translated literally, do not make a lot of mm -hmm. sense for the Russian audience. But when they are translated as they are, as the conflicts of generations, uh, etc., etc., people are very deeply involved, and it uh, contributes a lot to the popularity of and the development and the promotion of this uh, type of movies in the Russian market. So they support our research because they know that a lot develops, a lot of money is lost if not translated properly. Mm. I have another question. So, uh, when you're translating a movie or a TV series, you have to take... Uh, so, it's, it's, a, it's a, piece of, it's a, a single piece of work. So, when you're translating it, you have to also treat it as a single piece of work, Naturally. right? Naturally. So, you how does it... Bring, how does you it, see, you cannot bring a subtitle stream to the audience and do it, make it a do-it-yourself exercise, folks. This is the video, <laughs> this is a subtitle track, now join it together and probably <laughs> enjoy it, or probably not. It is the approach that won't work. But a lot of uh, fun subs and fun dubs are now developing that way. This is amateurish, but this is how it works when people are not properly told, taught. That's why we have to teach people all that, because otherwise we end up with uh, something very amateurish. I see that there are professional subtitles here, and they know the difference between professional and uh, amateur subs. Hmm. Uh, but when you're translating, uh, for example, subtitles uh, for a TV series, uh, does it mean that you have to watch the whole series first? Yes. So that that translation is uh, adequate and uh, high quality. Yes, because when you translate it, when you translate a, what you translate, you do not translate the text of a film. You translate mm -hmm. a film. So if you want to yeah. translate a film, you have to watch the film first. If you want mm -hmm. to translate a series, you have to watch a series first. It will be very disturbing if at a certain point, uh, for example, uh, one of our translators had a very good uh, uh, sample. In Russian, ice pops uh, may be candies. Ice pops. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. uh, she started translating uh, without watching the very last minute. And after mm. she watched it, she understood that these were ice creams. And then <laughs> all this had to be, uh, because it, uh, uh, in the last short, 
uh, the main character was given this ice pop, and it turned out to be a full size ice cream. So mm -hmm. this is that's why uh, the video was dominant and is dominant. So and uh, she had to roll back and translate everything again. Well, I ch to change the terminology. Hmm. Yeah. Going back to the skills that uh, a translator working in audio video audio uh, visual translation should have. So you mentioned tra uh, that a translator should be able to transcribe text, not just translate. Uh, then, obviously, uh, as you also mentioned, uh, he or she should be able to uh, analyze the video. Yeah. Uh, could you talk a bit more about that, please? Uh, well, what is meant? Uh, you see, when we watch uh, the video, the video is supposed to give us a lot of information about characters, who these people are, uh, to give where it all happens a long, long ago in a faraway galaxy, for example. Uh, actually, the video establishes uh, the time, the duration, the characters. When we do an audiovisual translation, uh, in Russian, for example, the gender thing, you have to understand mm -hmm. who these people are. For example, in Russian, uh, all family names ending with O are neutral. But it cannot be neutral. There is no neutral gender. You see? Mm -hmm. Uh, all Japanese names sound to Russian as, uh, uh, for example, Tanako may be a man or a woman. You cannot dis determine who this person is. You just have to watch it. So you have to analyze mm -hmm. a lot and you have to see how the characters relate to each other. For example, they may uh, say s sweet and flattering words to each other, but their faces are very angry. And uh, it sounds, it gives a special uh, kind of uh, uh, feeling or a special, mm -hmm. uh, you have to treat no, the words probably. differently. And for example, the culture thing, uh, one of, uh, Sihan again mentioned the more issue of profanity. Uh, you see, the thing about profanity is that it's very often, its translation depends on uh, uh, the visual part of it. If two friends met each other after a long time, they can talk to each other using a lot of sweet, profane characteristics, like calling each other names. But when you translate it directly, it will look as if they are going to quarrel and kill each other. So you have just to look at the video and see that they are backslapping, kind of having a good time. It's all different. So you have to analyze the video. You have to learn to analyze a shot and we have a several piece of uh, uh, our course which is devoted to how the pictures the shots the sequences of shots are analyzed what they really mean so we study film production i understand that it's film studies but you cannot avoid it when you translate medical books you have to know mm -hmm. at least something about the things you are translating. When you try translating legal document, it is always better if you have a degree in law. When you do the computer programming, being a software engineer is a boon. In this case, uh, when you translate a movie, knowing the history of the cinema, the language of the movies is a boon because you actually, it is, uh, you know more about the very essence of the subject you are translating. Hmm. And what about the technical skills that a translator needs? Uh, Working with programs, things like that. The, a translator, an audiovisual translator, uh, yeah. doesn't have, uh, well, actually, uh, the only skill that is, uh, some people think that the only skill necessary for doing audiovisual translation is the ability to watch movies. And we are paid for <laughs> watching movies. You see, it is amusing when some young people are asked why you are interested in audiovisual translation. Well, I'm going to watch a movie and I'm going to translate it. I'm going to be paid for that. It's actually mm -hmm. kind of your favorite pastime being paid for. A dream <laughs> coming true. But it's not that way because usually you are responsible for the integration of what you translate uh, with the output. So you need to know subtitling. Uh, uh, knowing subtitling programs for an audiovisual translation is a uh, uh, very 
valuable skill. It is not necessary. You may not, uh, you do not need it if you are just, if you just want to remain a translator, but it would be a bonus. Uh, mm -hmm. Working in, the, in a studio, doing dubbing or voiceover, I mean supervising it, like uh, not doing it yourself because uh, very few translators have good speaking skills. I'm very much against translators doing the voiceover themselves. It's, uh, as I call it, uh, the poor man option. It, is, it is, shouldn't work that way because uh, I'm not sure that most of the people who attend this webinar uh, have the actor speaking skills in their curricula. But uh, working in, a, in the studio as an editor, as a supervisor, as an assistant supervisor, it's important because you understand how it all works, how actors are going to work with the text that you translate. Because in some cases you think you did a decent job and actors start swearing because you have a lot of strange sound combinations which sound mm. very differently when spoken in dramatic speech. Well, you have to know all that. So these are competences that you need to learn. We include subtitling in our courses as well. Is there mm -hmm. any kind of a specific uh, audiovisual translation tools? Maybe some, some 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 sort of software that translators need to know if yeah. they want if they want to no. work in this field. No, subtitling subtitling programs are all right. Uh, there are a lot of them. There are professional and uh, non-professional programs. If uh, these programs and now uh, we also move into working with glossaries as we do the translation of various se series, which are, for example, 52, 26 episodes long. Uh, we need something that is similar to translation memory tools, but they are different. It mm -hmm. is uh, glossaries. You need to compose glossaries which list how this or that character was called 15 episodes ago and who actually he or she is. Uh, did she or he hit the main character or was she or he in love with him or her? You need to know their relationship. So the glossary here is more of a personal file. It's like the police file. Mm -hmm. You need to know who this person is. Yes, there are no such things. We have to create them ourselves and some of our partners have their own uh, custom-made uh, glossary manager. But the, such tools haven't been developed so far. Because uh, mm -hmm. most computer software developers just didn't look into the uh, real requirements of audiovisual translators. Why do you think is that? Is it because the field is very, very narrow? No, no. Uh, because the approach is very different. You need to change the thinking. Because uh, when you do uh, an audiovisual, when you do a machine translation thing, well, like a program, it's a very good piece of software, but software developers have a, a mode of thinking which is very different from the mode of thinking that our type of translation requires. And we have kind of communication progress. We merely cannot explain what we need because we usually see in their eyes a question. You need this correspond to that. No, it's not that fast. How come, folks? There is always a direct relationship between, or maybe a fuzzy <laughs> one, but the amount of fuzziness can always be uh, digitized. No, it cannot, folks. Okay, mm. then we won't do that. You see, that <laughs> you understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, it is a thing that uh, it is um, the audiovisual translation is uh, the field where a human needs the support of a machine, not the vice versa. Mm -hmm. Not the machine needs the support of a human to do the post editing. The machine is the storage tool, the tool that assists with the integration, the storage of the data, the database management, but that's it. Mm -hmm. So that's it. That's why I May, it might be sound pretty disappointing for our colleagues in uh, machine translation development, but still they need to pay more attention to uh, the needs of such types of uh, translation as ours. Yeah, because I it's uh, conversation. it's obviously it's on the rise because as you mentioned, uh, it's uh, since 
you said that since 2009 it's uh, the the amount of content grew 50 times Yes, uh, it is simple. The, met the, the math between this uh, is very simple. Uh, the amount of uh, audiovisual content grows by 30% every year since mm. 2009. Mm. If you just do the simple math, 50 yeah. years, you have just 50 fold, the 50-fold growth, and it mm. includes everything. It includes Netflix, it includes uh, a lot of internet TVs, specialized TVs. You know, there is now a separate TV channel for everybody. Cooks, uh, fitness freaks, uh, software developers, uh, computer experts, everybody has his or her own uh, special internet TV channel with a mm. lot of content. Number <laughs> Unfortunately, translator lag behind in this respect, but yeah, uh, oh, I think we will catch up pretty soon. But <laughs> we will end up also with thousands and thousands of hours of content. Yeah. This will need to be, we are translators, we are a very multilingual community, and we will need it to be subtitled, translated into all languages that we speak. So imagine, so that's why the amount of translation is, uh, you see, when you do a production, an audiovisual production or a game. Well, for example, the game development industry is, uh, from the very beginning, was based on the model of the global releases. All games are released globally, at mm. least in 15, 20 linguistic markets. Movies are also distributed in many countries, otherwise they won't make the profit when a movie costs a hundred million dollars just yeah. to pass the break even point you need to broadcast it well at least in the united states and china and india is also a very good choice because these three countries will make you the good box office but india is 22 official languages mm -hmm. ah. 22 and all these languages uh, will need the movie to be translated into you see well it's uh, uh, that's why the amount of uh, uh, the content to be translated is amazing mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so yeah mm -hmm. i just wanted to say that if some software engineers are listening to us right now that's uh, probably a gold mine for you when if you develop such a tool that uh, you mentioned earlier. <laughs> Another interesting subject is uh, uh, that we also can talk about is how you can evaluate the quality of audiovisual translation. What are some of the criteria? Uh, uh, let me put it that way. Uh, the first criteria uh, is uh, uh, you do the transcreation you transfer an audiovisual production into your own culture, into your own language. The first criteria is uh, if an audiovisual production sounds foreign or alien to you, it is uh, a flop, it mm. is a failure. Uh, the more natural, the more uh, domesticated it sounds, as if people are talking in your own language, discussing pro problems which are familiar to you, uh, then it is a translation well done. That's one thing. The second thing is technical. Uh, subtitle should fit into two lines. When you do the lip sync, you have to match the lip movements. If, it, if this requirement is not met, the translation is redundant. Uh, and uh, you see, my favorite comparison is uh, when you translate a book which is 100 pages long and end up with a book which is 120 pages long, your publishers kind of make a face, but they still buy more paper and uh, print a thicker book. But when you translate a 100 minute long movie, and end up with a text which will need 110 movies just to be pronounced, mm -hmm. no one up there <laughs> will lengthen the time. No one will give you these additional 10 minutes. So mm -hmm. you just have to 
fit it into the time. If you don't fit, the movie is a flop. Yeah. This is the second. And uh, uh, the third one, uh, I'd rather say, if, it's, it, if it doesn't sound like a story, and if, if, if a comedy stops being a comedy, if a horror movie stops scaring, being scary, it's a flop. You, if you don't reach the emotional level that is necessary, it's a flop. You may use all the right words. You may call a spade a spade. But if this spade doesn't make you, doesn't frighten you, it's not a horror movie. There, is, there must be something behind this image of a spade that is really scary. You see? You understand mm -hmm. me? Mm -hmm. We have a very interesting comment from Aurelie. She writes, uh, I don't know for other countries, but in France, subtitling is underpaid and undervalued. However, translating for voiceover dubbing is in a better situation as it's easier to make a living from it. And uh, we actually also have a question. So uh, where can translators working, audiovisual translators can find clients who pay well and uh, value? Yeah, and a lot of develop, a lot de a lot depends on uh, the so-called uh, uh, tradition, uh, because uh, some countries are, as we call them, subtitling countries. For example, Scandinavian countries uh, have a, a very pretty a long history of subtitling. They started doing the subtitles in the, the 30s uh, of the 20th century, 1930, and they never stopped. They have almost 80 years of subtitling behind their backs, and they, in their countries, subtitling, sub translation for subtitling is well paid. France is a dubbing country, just as Germany is a dubbing country. Uh, in France, subtitles, uh, France was, uh, France in fact has a very different history because France was one of the countries which was uh, the first to actually, the first movie uh, with subtitles was broadcast in Paris in 1929. And uh, actually, you were the first country to launch this service into the market. But at a certain point, uh, you started being a dubbing country. I can give you a more, exa an, an, a more exact date. It was 1958, the Fifth Republic, mm -hmm. uh, because it was the rebirth of the French national uh, tradition, etc., etc., and uh, France again became a dubbing country. Russia used to be a dubbing country when it were when we used to be the Soviet Union. We had one of the best dubbing schools in the world. After that, we had a huge influx of foreign audiovisual content, and we needed to somehow uh, localize it. We became a voiceover country, and right now, and subtitling was pretty alien because the uh, older generation, people in their 40s and their 50s, do not like subtitles. Mm -hmm. But, for example, the younger generation, like uh, in their 20s, and especially the generation of current teens in Russia, already read subtitles, and we are gradually becoming a subtitling country. That's why the pay is different. Do you understand me already? And the same situation in Turkey, I know. Because we have very good partners in Turkey, in the University of Ankara. Uh, and uh, she told us a lot. She taught us a short course on the audiovisual translation in Turkey this August. And I know about the situation uh, in Turkey. So what are some of the places where translators can find clients for audiovisual translation? Uh, you see, uh, these places are... Uh, you see, a lot of companies, if you have the, uh, the so-called accompanying skills, like if you are a subtitler, there are a lot of uh, current platforms and uh, international com companies like uh, Voice and Script International, Deluxe Digital, uh, like uh, SDI Media, which are in constant need of uh, audiovisual translations for translators for various languages, but they need trained audiovisual translators. Mm -hmm. That's why we started with the training, and that's why we opened the, the online and offline courses for students, because uh, you understand that you have to change the thinking. Yep. I, when I told you about the six mm -hmm. differences, you understand that you need to be taught to think differently. 
Mm. And this is where we start. We pick up students who have an aptitude for that and we teach them. After that, they can apply to various uh, companies and they have a very good, a very fair, very good chance of passing the testing because they know what the whole thing is about. Because all these companies have filters, have testing systems uh, which are actually designed to determine how well a person understands uh, the nature of audiovisual translation. It's, believe me, it's visible because we have this system, Who Films, we are one of the major suppliers of subtitles in, the, uh, in Russian and several other languages of the area, and we have our own filtering system because uh, before we started our courses, the rejection rate was uh, about 95-96%. Mm -hmm. Right now, uh, among the students whom we teach, the rejection rate is about 50%. It's still a lot, but it uh, actually uh, it has to do more with the personal abilities of the people, not with their training. It's actually half of the people are have enough skills to be hired either by our company or later they are hired by some other company. So we have a lot of positive reviews from our students who are hired either by us or other major companies worldwide or in Russia. Mm. So, they, so this is how it can be taught. Training plays the paramount role. And uh, what are some of the programs? Are there any special programs that teach uh, translators how to work with audiovisual translation? You yes, mentioned your global, school. You know, globally. Uh, in Russia, we are the only one. Mm. Uh, globally, if you speak about, uh, about the world in general, the very good courses are offered in several British universities. Uh, in Spain, uh, Spain has a very good school of audiovisual translation in the University of uh, uh, Catalonia in Barcelona, University of Vic, and several other universities. Also in Vienna, mm -hmm. uh, and push, uh, as far as I know, uh, there is a very a good course in the University of Ankara, but a small one because uh, uh, in Ankara they have this. In Turkey they have the same problem with uh, they have the uphill battle with uh, people who do not accept audiovisual translation. The same the same thing, you see. <laughs> uh, also uh, in several other countries, but not for example such a huge market as uh, the Indian one has only one or two courses offering audiovisual translation. The same thing is in China. They have very good courses in gaming translation, but uh, after all, China is one of the countries where lots and lots of games are being developed, so it, it uh, would be a surprise if they didn't pay enough attention to that respect. But, for example, as to the movies, uh, China produces a lot of uh, high-quality visual content, almost uh, the same amount as India does. But Indian films are well-known and Chinese films are still confined to the Chinese market. This is one of the uh, pains that they suffer from. I, I spoke to their film producers, etc., etc. Very many countries just do not know how to translate it. Mm. The thing is actually not the cultural, not the ideological, not the cultural, it's the linguistic. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is really, uh, th this is why uh, this is a very promising uh, area, domain of development, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes. talking about talking about your school, uh, you I know that you offer some uh, offline uh, programs. I think in Saint Petersburg. In Moscow, Saint Petersburg, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right now and in Moscow, Saint Petersburg, and uh, yeah, there will be a program in Yekaterinburg, but the basic programs are Moscow and Saint Petersburg. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. have any plans of expansion at the moment? probably some other Russian cities or some Ukrainian cities? Uh, yes, uh, we actually, uh, our courses were taught in uh, uh, 11 Russian universities mm -hmm. over the last two years. So we taught them in Nizhny Novgorod. Mm -hmm. uh, we um, also are going to teach a separate course in April in Riga, in Latvia, outside Russia. Uh, uh, there are several more 
universities uh, and corporate clients which uh, asked us for short stunts, like one week. Mm -hmm. A crash course on audiovisual translation, because most of the translators do not need a long course to get uh, their brains rewired. Actually, we are, to use this specific term, we rewire their thinking. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that we uh, teach them to do something differently. We just rewire their uh, modes of thinking, because if they have an, uh, an ability to transcreate, just showing them how to do it, showing them what are the units of transcreation, teaching them, doing some practice, already start the positive processes. So uh, we do have plans for expansion and we are open to offers, uh, various offers. Uh, well, I think it uh, may be discussed in our later correspondence with you or other participants of uh, uh, this webinar, if they are interested. Hmm. Uh, Alexei, do you think uh, those uh, courses uh, are more suitable for established translators, people who already have some experience in translation under their belts, or even newcomers to the translation profession, profession as such can take those courses as well? Hmm. Unfortunately, uh, before you, uh, it's like uh, transcreation is actually breaking the rules. Uh, it's like uh, with sports. Before you start breaking the rules, you have to learn them in a very deep way. It's like with driving. Before you start driving restlessly, before you start speeding up, you first need to learn how to drive. Uh, so you ca cannot uh, start learning uh, uh, audiovisual translation at the very beginning of your uh, career as a translator. You need to have some basis, you have to know the rules, otherwise uh, you won't either learn how to transcreate and or learn how to translate. You will be lost on both counts. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah, that makes perfect sense. We have oh. some questions in the chat box. <laughs> so the, yes, first, the first one yeah, is from uh, Sihan. She asks, do you generally take a different step in dubbing translation in terms of uh, constraints compared to subbing, not technical? Uh, yes, uh, we do because uh, uh, you see, um, subtitling is basically a reading experience. You perceive uh, the information by reading it. And uh, when you listen to some text, it is actually an exercise in hearing, in listening. And uh, I can give you one example. In Russian, it is uh, very amusing. In Russian, the swear words, uh, for example, are perceived very differently when they are written and when they are spoken. For example, some swear word, some taboo word, when it is written in a subtitle, it is perceived by the Russian audience as very, very inappropriate. We either smile or are ashamed. When we hear it, it's all right. So it is, we take very different approach uh, to uh, using that. So that's one thing. Uh, did I answer your question? Yep. <laughs> uh, and uh, I often reach out to me if I were interested to offer training in subtitling. Yeah, we have uh, another question from uh, Monica. I I'm going to read it out loud so other people who are watching this uh, or listening to this in recording can also I get the idea what the question is about. So a question for Alexei, having been in the industry for a long time, I also have a small company where I am the uh, subtitling team leader. I often see people reach out to me to ask me if I were interested to offer training in subtitling. As in Italy, there is not that much of an offer offices. I've never thought about it for one right. simple reason. Know, how, do you, how, how do you choose participants? There are many people out there coming out of the university with no absolute talent. And the extension of this, uh, there is uh, an extension of this question yeah. below. 
Yep. Uh, after studying languages for years, uh, they didn't seem to have the necessary native equivalent level of both source and target languages. Uh, and then, as you said, uh, that kind of thinking can be taught, but only to a certain extent. I have the impression that if you don't have a class with the same level of language skills, the course won't work for anyone. You see, the thing is, uh, which language are you, are, uh, Monica? Uh, you are absolutely right when you point out to the mastery of their own language, because uh, you can uh, improve your mastery of uh, foreign language. There are a lot of ways to do that, a lot of courses to improve that, but improving the mastery of your own language is a task which is much more complicated. So usually, uh, when we select a course, we pay more attention to the, uh, the task is simpler because uh, we try to evaluate the level of the mastery of their own language. Mm. Uh, that's why how we try to, yes, I understand that uh, there are sometimes classes which uh, are almost total flops because people just came here because it's, uh, audiovisual translation is a fad, learning subtitling is a fad, it's a, fashionable theme, uh, but they don't have the mastery of uh, either a foreign language or their own native one. You have to teach them because it's making money. But I try to reduce such classes to the smallest possible number because actually they are very exhausting. You actually, at a certain point, you feel that you are wasting your time. But you see, usually people who come to be taught audiovisual translation have at least some realistic understanding of themselves. Well, mm. that's at least that uh, it is that way in Russia. I don't know about Italy, because but, well, I, I was in Italy uh, this October. Uh, we were invited to the festival of uh, dubbing uh, actors in uh, Sabona, and uh, they also mentioned to me that there are very few translators who can do proper jobs in that respect. Um, do you think no, that... No, 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 no. I don't think uh, that it is for everyone either. You see, I absolutely agree with you. It is... Uh, uh, it cannot be, because uh, not all people can dance. Not all people can... Uh, it's, transcreation is actually an artistic skill. I'm sorry, not all people can paint, not all people can dance, not all people can, can sing or write novel. This is the same thing with that. So it's, it's, it's your job as a teacher or uh, as an instructor of this course to identify those talents and help people develop those talents. Yeah, you see again, uh, Monica, I tough. wrote that not all language graduates can be subtitled as right because some people perceive it as a technical skill. It is not. It is not because it is, for us it's a translation skill. Uh, we have another question from Alex. She's asking, in case you work translation for dubbing and for subtitling, I assume you have, uh, which one do you enjoy the most? Uh, myself? Yeah. I mean, as a, as a practitioner, yeah, I'm a practitioner. I'm, you have to maintain your form. It's like with sports. You have to not do it from time to time. You have to constantly uh, train yourself. Well, as to myself, uh, Honestly speaking, I love translation for subtitling more. Mm. Uh, I'm more of a logical person. Uh, for me, subtitling is uh, a more logical thing. I understand that uh, uh, dubbing is even more artistic, even for my taste. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's my personal, personal preference because I understand, I, I can explain, when I explain my decisions while doing subtitling, mm -hmm. I can be logical. Mm -hmm. I do not refer to my to the favorite argument like I see it that way. <laughs> very often with dubbing. Yeah. Why do you translate it that way? Because I see it that way. Well, it's my personal. <laughs> mm -hmm. Have I over? Yeah. Uh, Jihan, Jihan? Um, uh, have you ever got frustrated in the middle of translating? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, surely, because it's like, you see, uh, do you 
it's like asking me, do you, have you ever felt pain while touching a hot surface? Always. <laughs> because it's uh, getting frustrated. It's actually the foundation of our profession, because at a certain point you are always frustrated, um, especially when doing the audiovisual translation, because there are a lot of things, for example, which are referring to cultural uh, aspects which are very very difficult to translate so it's like uh, for example a lot of people celebrate some holidays in the in the source country a lot of people celebrate for example uh, for us Thanksgiving well we all know about that but uh, the real importance of that holiday uh, we don't understand it and a, a lot of countries have their own like uh, traditions uh, Etc. Etc. It's uh, you get frustrated. How to do that? <laughs> it's hard, it's hard here. It's uh, for hard of hearing. I think yes. Dog barking. Everybody. Another shot that one will be everybody laughing. <laughs> Sorry about that. So someone's uh, probably standing behind our door, and so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That happens. What, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Yes. Uh, yep. We have a question from Una. Uh, I have translated for subtitles, but never for dub material. How do you take into account lip movement when you are translating into text? Uh, you see, the answer is. When you take lip movements into account at their face value, as uh, uh, one of the famous researchers uh, of uh, dubbing uh, translation, Frederick Schoem, from the University of uh, Barcelona wrote, uh, when you do the translation for lip sync, the matching of lip movements takes absolute uh, superiority over all other times of other types of equivalence. You do not think about linguistic equivalence. You have to match the lip movement. It is good that lip syncing at large takes not more than thirty percent of uh, any movie because uh, you have to match lips when you see lips. Mm. When you don't see lips, you don't have to do that. And in most movies, uh, uh, this the stupidest, I should say, requirement which we have are, uh, listen folks, I have an educational course with a professor speaking for 90 minutes and I want to lip sync it. It's a thing that cannot be done because otherwise you have to either match lips and completely forget about the essence of what he or she is talking about or mm -hmm you have to do subtitles or do the voiceover to preserve the initial meaning. You see? So when you do mm -hmm. the lip sync, yeah. you do the lip sync. That's it. Another question Another question from Jihan. She asks, uh, how is the process of hearing impaired subbing? Uh, how goes the process of uh, hearing impaired subbing? Uh, before you start doing hearing impaired subbing, you have to understand uh, you see, the no there is a notion of uh, plot relevant sounds. You have to do remember I mentioned that when we do the translation for audio of audiovisual productions, you have to perceive them as uh, stories. Stories have plots. Stories have plots how the events develop. Some of the sounds like dog barking, in our case, they do not relate to the plot of our webinar. And I wouldn't mention mm. it in a hearing impaired subtitle, unless we all start laughing. Well, if we all react mm. to that barking, I will have to write dog barking, because it is a plot mm. relevant sound. So first you have to understand which sounds are plot relevant and which are not. First, you have to understand the plot, and then you select the sound that relate to it. Uh, you have to you select the sound that influence the behavior of uh, uh, characters. The yes, characters. for example, if we all look that way, 
there might be door like slamming uh, a gunshot wind opening the door there was something that made me look that way right so this is a plot relevant sound mm -hmm. and if for example i write pe paper uh, like paper folded or the wind sound we hear some ooh sound in the background nobody pays any attention to that it's not a plot relevant sound did i answer your question hmm. interesting yeah Another question from Jihan, are there any predetermined phrases or wording that is assigned to translators to type, like uh, screeching, groans, or is it up to, to the translator to decide up to the, uh, uh, what to, up to type? It is uh, actually the uh, burden on the shoulders of a translator while doing all types of audio visual translation is pretty heavy because you have to decide a lot of things. For example, when you are doing uh, uh, Translation for dubbing, you are sometimes expected, in Russia at least, to write the so-called uh, scripting remarks, your ideas about how this or that phrase has to be pronounced. You have to mm. select the keywords, etc., etc. You act more like a playwright. This is when you do the dubbing. Mm. So you make a lot of decisions which, uh, in other types of translation, you are not required to make. You always are asked, listen, Keep in mind your audience, how they, it will perceive uh, uh, the translation that you are producing. Uh, which preferences? Are... Uh, looks like we have answered all the questions from our audience. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Alexei? There is a uh, question. You, you generally have specific preferences from your client. Yes, uh, your client regulates your behavior, but it, you are very on a very loose uh, leash because uh, in other cases, when, for example, doing some translations, you have uh, pages and pages of directions on how you should translate this, that, etc., etc. In our case, for example, Netflix guide, the Netflix guide, we are doing a lot of Netflix translation. Uh, the Netflix guide is the most detailed I've ever seen, and it's four pages long, a pretty detailed one, uh, mostly technical. Uh, but uh, they also have the so-called uh, symbols chart. They tell us which symbols to use and which not to use. Uh, some of the companies have uh, the dictionaries or short short reference lists of uh, swear words they want to, don't want to use. In case of Netflix, they it, they say usually reproduce it as close to the original as possible, considering the legal limitations, <laughs> etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it is. Uh, uh, the companies vary in that respect. Mm. Uh, what to put between brackets for more frequent sounds? You see, you know, that in different cultures, uh, we have our own sets of phrases. For example, in our country, all, uh, well, yes, moaning, yes, we use moaning, we use, uh, Tapping, ringing the phones, ringing pretty often, etc., etc. For more frequent sounds, yes. And uh, one of our clients sent to us a reference list, uh, a reference list for uh, the ways they want to denote the most frequent sounds that are to be reflected in the subtitles. H I Jihan H I Yeah H I Hearing impaired Hearing impaired yeah mm -hmm. Hearing impaired mm. Well um I guess it's we... a lot of hearing I understand but in Turkey uh as we were told during the course in St. Petersburg the professor from the University of Ankara uh, mentioned that uh, in our country, you see, hearing impaired subtitles are not uh, very popular either because uh, usually the introduction of hearing impaired subtitling 
is a kind of a government act because in Scandinavia, in Sweden, in Finland, uh, hearing impaired subtitles are required uh, by special uh, government acts. In Great Britain, it, uh, it was in 1978 when they introduced uh, the legislation requiring obligatory hard of hearing subtitling. Before that, there was nothing. In the United States, in 1982, in our country, no such legislation has uh, ever has been adopted so far, and neither has been neither such legislation has been adopted in Turkey, as far as I remember. So that's that's why you probably never saw subtitles uh, hearing in print subtitles in Turkey in Jihan. Yes, probably this is the answer because uh, never, it, it it is not required, and it's uh, uh, usually uh, people who produce and distribute. Uh, audiovisual content, try to minimize their expenses. Yeah. And uh, unless you are required, you do not do hard of hearing subtitling. Because subtitles, uh, as a, in general, are necessary. But hard of hearing subtitles are sort of a luxury item, which is uh, not necessarily present in the requirements that uh, the distributors have. Yep. Okay. So this is going to be the last question <laughs> from yeah. another question. Yeah. From Jihan. Uh, how do you evaluate the Netflix impact on the industry? Huge. The impact is huge because uh, uh, I was in Berlin this November, and the vice president of Netflix was giving a giving a presentation on the uh, approach to subtitling that Netflix has, uh, and uh, he said. Well, I quote, uh, we uh, treat subtitling as a kind of a literary text, uh, mm. which uh, is just actually a piece of art, and we want our subtitles to be perceived as such. This is the level which we want and strive to achieve. And uh, that's how they brought back the issue of uh, uh, human presence in the audiovisual translation. So Netflix really made a huge impact on the perception of our world because they want us again to be masters of translation, not just assistants to somebody or something translating. Hmm. I think Jihan, it's a great Jihan, point may I answer to... your question? Yep. <laughs> yeah. This is a great note to wrap up our webinar on. So I want to thank, first of all, Alexei for all the great information that you provided today. I'm sure that a lot of people, people will find that very useful. And I want to thank everyone who joined us tonight and for your great questions. This is every time when we go live on this platform, it's always such a great experience because of you guys, because you're watching us and asking us questions. I, I want to ask you a question. May I share with the participants my email so that some of them might ask Absolutely. me questions? Absolutely. We can, yep. we can, yes, we can yep. include your email in the show notes. We are publishing show notes uh, every Sunday, right, Mitri? Yep. Uh, on the open mic, so you can just send, or you can type it uh, here in right, the chat sure. box. I'm doing that. Yes, and uh, yep. you can also, s oh, we have your email address, so we'll just include it in the show notes so that people who will watch the recording could send you the questions too, right? Yeah. Great. Thanks, Thanks everyone. I was so glad uh, to see that the interest in audiovisual translation is not restricted just to the borders of Russia, but it is a worldwide it's phenomenon. <laughs> I'm, glad that there are, I'm glad that there are so many people who are thinking the way I think, because in a, to a certain extent, audiovisual translators are kind of a, let me tell you the truth, we are kind of a sect sharing the same set of belief in the uh, dominance of the human translation. This is our belief, our supreme belief, and I'm glad that a lot of people share it. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much, Alice. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, and uh, we'll see you next week, right? Okay. 
Yep. Bye. Yeah, we we'll see you all next week. Uh, don't forget to check out the uh, website of our sponsor. That's mercad.ai. And we'll see you guys next week. Have a wonderful evening or day or morning, everyone, depending <laughs> on where you're watching. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.